meme prevents that and they die through that stage. So like when you get home from work and you're taking your pants off and then you just get stuck and you die. <laughs> yes. <laughs> That's one way to think about it. <laughs> or diaple dust. Yeah. Di- dipel. Di- diaper diaper dust. Diaper dust. Well, <laughs> once. That's what helps me, you know, not get <laughs> rashy in this season when you're walking around 15,000 steps and you're <laughs> a big guy like me. So you need that not, diaper dust. Not to be confused with talcum powder, even. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Would you like to start? Sure. Okay. Hey, foliage. F- Let's. <laughs> nope. <laughs> Try again. <laughs> um. I hey, can bleep that and leave it in. <laughs> hey, root whispers. Um, root whispers. Root whispers. We're gonna keep changing it up until something sticks. Yeah. I'm not sure if this episode will air before or after the episode where we decide that the temporary name is Green Team. Green Team. I, I, I'm also, you know, maybe Leaf Lickers. <laughs> what, what else did you have on your list here? <laughs> uh, I can't remember. You wrote it down there. I remember Leaf Licker. Li- leaf Lickers. Yeah, none of these are very appropriate. They're not bad, though. F- foliage Fondlers. <laughs> yeah, that's that's fine. <laughs> Root rubbers. <laughs> Root rubbers. <laughs> and leaf lickers. <laughs> I like leaf lickers. So am I just bleeping all these? No, they're PG. I feel like what you do with that with those words in uh, your brain, I'm not responsible oh, for. Okay. Got it. Yeah. Got it. Okay. Mm-hmm. I feel like root rubbers is acceptable. <laughs> I mean, that's what you got to do when you take the plant out of the pot and you're kind of rubbing the roots across your body. Uh, <laughs> Briar, that's that's what you have to do is you, uh, you know, to to encourage active adventitious root growth. So and then you don't get spiraling roots in the pot. And don't or, use leaf shine. You lick the leaves. If you need a cleaner looking leaf, just lick them. It's fine. Mm. Just because lots of things are on that leaf that the plant is kind of pulled out of the air. That's good for you. <laughs> Thank you, Ethan, for providing me with so much usable content to edit. <laughs> okay. All right. Going to do a restart here. Root. <laughs> I'm gonna say leaf lickers. Okay, yeah, that's what you're. That's uh, what you're sticking with for this episode. Or flora fellas. I think that's us. We're the flora fellas. Yeah, that's our temporary nickname. So, all right, we're gonna tie. We're gonna try our, this. Our off. interim nickname that was given to us by a listener. Okay, so welcome back, everybody. You are listening to the Take It or Leave It podcast. We are the flora fellas. Ethan Wise and Nick Farrington, so dubbed by a listener. Yes, and we are going to try out the Branchy Bunch. <laughs> How about that for our listeners? How are you all, the Branchy Bunch, doing today? It's rhetorical because I can't just, hear you. I I like that one a lot because it just really rolls off the tongue. The Branchy Bunch. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the Bramble Bunch. What's up, our Bramble buddies? <laughs> I like the Bramble Buddies. This will definitely air before our episode where we explain the Bramble conspiracy. Yeah. But now this is just a teaser for everybody to wonder what the Bramble conspiracy is. Yep. Yeah. So before we continue, is any of that salvageable? Maybe. (laughs) I'll do one normal one. Okay. (laughs) Okay. Maybe I'll just keep all of this in. Okay. (laughs) <laughs> we just want to really we really want to give the listeners uh, the behind the scenes feel this is this is the real yeah uncut take it or leave this it pod- <laughs> portion of the podcast <laughs> uh 
Okay. So, all right. Welcome back to the Take It or Leave It podcast, you vivacious. <laughs> okay. Hey, green team. This is Ethan Wise. With, and I'm Nick Farringdon. And this is the Take It or Leave It podcast. Thanks for tuning in again for episode blank. Uh, we'll leave that to be filled in whatever we feel like filling this in. Hey, Take It or Leafers. Uh, this is Ethan Wise. <laughs> I think we could probably make a whole episode just on you going through these intros. <laughs> hey, welcome back to the Take It or Leave It podcast. This is Ethan Wise with... I'm Nick Farrington. With I'm Nick Farrington. <laughs> with, with I'm. <laughs> with I'm Nick Farrington. Uh, that is his full name, in case you were curious. And uh, we're trying... We've been... Uh, what you're probably going to have edited out of the beginning of this episode is the 10 minutes that Nick and I have been playing with uh, as far as what we were going to refer to our listeners as. We're still open to suggestions. We've gotten some good ones in, uh, but we're still trying to figure out what our listeners would be referred to as. Nick has told me that he's not entirely fond of root rubbers, um, but that's kind of where I'm at. You know, it's something that we all have to do when we're planting up things. You're taking your plant out of the pot. You're, uh, you know, you're kind of breaking up the root system. You're, you're rubbing the roots. Sometimes you're, you know, just ever so slightly playing with the roots. It, it's a fun thing to do. It's okay. It's not bad. You're not. You don't want to have root spiraling. You turn on your nice little music, your slow jams, you get in the mood, whatever you have to do to enjoy gardening. We are not here to judge you. Can't I, keep like, any of this. Like I've said <laughs> before, horticulturists aren't here to judge the way you look, judge the way you dress. We just judge the way you pronounce plant names. True. We do do that sometimes. Yeah. Yep. But as far as what you want to do to the roots of that plant or to the leaf of that plant, what if you put a plant in the bathroom and you like it watching you, that's totally fine. We're not here to judge you. So <laughs> jumping back a subject this is to something that our listeners might find useful. <laughs> It does come up every once in a while. Don't you hate it? when I, It's just the worst when you realize that you've been mispronouncing a plant name for like the whole time. Which and, one have you mispronounced um, recently or in the past that you were corrected on? I feel like, well, pertaining to today's episode um, where we're going to be talking about pest management, I feel like permethrin or pi, I always get pyrethrins and permethrin. Sure. Permethrin, permethrin. I've heard it pronounced both, but I believe permethrin is the correct one, right? Permethrin and pyrethrin. Yeah. So two different things. Yeah. Similar, two different things. But yeah, pyrethrin, permethrin. Right. For the plant. So I've been mispronouncing botanical names forever. I think there was one. I remember a supervisor at Hair Nursery where I worked at before. Why I went in and I can't remember what I'd said. It was about honeysuckle. And keep in mind that my supervisor, this guy, trained under Michael Durr at the University of Illinois. Uh, Michael Durr is the author of the Durr Manual, which is kind of the plant Bible for a lot of people who go to hort school for trees and shrubs. It's just this giant, massive book that has all kinds of ins and outs as far as understanding the biology of the plant, the physical characteristics of the plant. And then he also gives characteristics of cultivars of the plant. And it's very extensive, very informative. And so this person trained under Michael Durr and I go in there and I say, Hey, you know, is this stem cutting? Is this Lonacera? And he turns around in his chair and looks at me and says, what did you just say? And I said, look, Lona, Lona Sarah. And he said, do you mean Lona Sarah? I was like, probably now. Yeah, like, that was a test. <laughs> and you passed. <laughs> He's like, Lona Sarah. I was trying to see how much you know. Yeah. yeah. It's like, ah, uh, yep. That's what I'm referring to. Uh, so it's, we would, always, I mean, YG is one that we would hear a lot. Wigala. People commonly will ask Wigala. Where's yeah. Wiggla? And sometimes I'll outward. Or Wygelia. There's, yeah, there's no always extra that extra I, I that's yep. added in there. Yeah. I don't know if there's another one right off the bat that I'm, oh, Cotton Easter. 
instead of Katoni Aster. Yes. Now I can understand that because if you look at the spelling, mm-hmm. granted Katoni Aster just has one T, whereas Cotton Easter, the way that we know the the spelling would have two T's. Mm-hmm. But it does look when you write it out like Cotton Easter. Yeah. And the way that we speak English, you wouldn't assume that that is Katoni Aster. Mm-hmm. And also don't buy Katoni Aster. It's shit plants. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm sure it has its uses. I feel like more often than not, when I see it in landscaping, it doesn't look terribly appealing. Yeah, it's not a very well-kempt, attractive shrub. They've tried with some cultivars, but I'm not terribly sold yet. Yeah. Or uh, bromelade. Oh, man. <laughs> bromelade. And, um, oh, I've been recently corrected incorrectly. Or should we tell them the actual bromeliad? Oh, yeah. Bromeliad. <laughs> bromelade is what you take when you have an upset stomach. <laughs> right. You usually buy it in a tube at a gas station. <laughs> Rather than squeezing a lemon to make lemonade, you squeeze a bromeliad to make bromelade. <laughs> <laughs> when life gives you lemons make bromelade yes it's just like my gosh like like he's saying water malone too like, <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> avocado <laughs> but again for non-hort people we're not judging too hard yeah because right. we we make those mistakes often often i've been incorrectly corrected on how to spell or how to say something i said uh portalaca which is purslane. It's an commonly sold as an annual. Mm-hmm. Um, it's also a weed, but it right a often, perennial weed. Yeah, perennial weed or an attractive um, flowering succulent annual. Yeah, which those varieties do have a gorgeous flower. They're super heat tolerant. Or there's also a lot of people will use it as an edible for the the more common weedy. What what most people think of as a weed. Sure, and uh, someone that I work with said, hey, you said portalaca. It's actually portulaca. And I said, nope, it's portalaca. And I stick to that as far as the botanical spelling of mm-hmm. the name and and what Latin is. Mm-hmm. It is portalaca. However, yeah. commonly said as portulaca. Yeah, I've heard it as portulaca so many times that... You just know what it I is. I think I kind of end up defaulting to that, even though it's... Well, I mean, it's like echeveria is a succulent commonly, and technically it's echeveria right and you know i feel like on a previous episode maybe we edited this part out or you edited this part out we were trying to decide what the pronunciation of agastache is or hyssop agostiki is how you say it i don't like that right i hate it (laughs) i'm not saying i like agastache either right because it sounds like something you should have a doctor look at um (laughs) like it's like growing between your thighs or something (laughs) or under your armpits like oh i have an agastache rash or something like that but a gostiki just seems so flamboyant. I think I don't like the name of that plant so much that if I had the option to <laughs> be selling it, I wouldn't. <laughs> <laughs> Fair. So, yeah, technically it's a gostiki. And mm. so once I <laughs> no fa- thanks. once I found out that that was the correct pronunciation, I just call it hyssop now. <laughs> <laughs> I stopped saying agastache. <laughs> And I'm not going to say Agostiki, so I just refer to it as Hyssop. Yeah. I just, I feel like if I... It's like I refuse to call Dianthus Cheddar Pinks. <laughs> mm, why Cheddar? Don't know. Why? Where does Cheddar come? Uh, I looked it up once and I can't remember, but... And sometimes people just refer to them as Pinks. Yeah. Like, do you have any Pinks? And I'm like, that's none of your business. <laughs> um, But... I, I always have to like take a step back and, and kind of think like, oh, 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 they're referring to Dianthus. Right. Yeah. Um, some of these common names get so vague. Yeah. Do you have any of the uh, green leaf? Like what? <laughs> they all do. Yeah. <laughs> it gets tough too working in a garden center when people just refer to the, the cultivar name. You know, they might come in and just say, do you have any Sun King? I'm like, mm, mm-hmm. I mean, I know it now well enough, you know, they're, they're referring to the Sun King Aurelia, but it's not uncommon for people to come in and say, Hey, do you have, uh, the Dazzleberry shrub? And I'm like, you got to give me more. Yeah, just and some, some out, breeders. Oh, they're talking about a sedum. Yeah. And the cult of our name is called Dazzleberry. Yeah. Yeah. Just some, some breeders 
patented tra- or trademark name for whatever plant that may or may not be common. In a garden center setting, it is you certainly are playing 20 questions on yep. a regular basis. Yep. Man, we've really gotten off tangent. We have. Have we said what we're talking about this week? Not once. Okay. So this episode is actually about pests and disease management. Oh, I think I may have said it briefly. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Okay. So this is pest and disease management. It's okay. We're only 17 minutes in. (laughs) (laughs) This is what people are really wanting. Yeah. This is the real stuff. Yeah. They want. They they don't want to be educated. They just want two (laughs) pretentious horticulturists. Just trash talking anyone who comes into a garden center. Although we were also giving each other our own yeah. sage. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. They they definitely want uh, the first 10 minutes to be you bouncing around with what we can call our listeners. Or 10 minutes that'll probably end up being two by the time I edit a lot of it out. <laughs> Do we just say leaf likers? Is that better than leaf lickers? I don't know. Okay. All right. We're These still- all... We're still very much struggling with what to refer to our listeners. And probably meanwhile, all everyone listening is like, don't call me anything. (laughs) Right? (laughs) None of them want this. (laughs) We're your plant daddies. And we. Nope. No. (laughs) No. No. Is that? No. Okay. No. All right. Hmm. Okay. Well, we're still, we're still working on this. So so, we're still rubbing the roots out on this. (laughs) So circling back to our real actual topic for this week, we right. are discussing pest management and we'll gear that probably a little more specific to homeowners and houseplant owners and things like that. Some of this could get a little bit into greenhouse related pest management because some are it's not going to be agriculturally. We're not going to talk about yeah. broad agricultural use of pesticide or fungicide or, or uh, management. This is and some of these pests that we're going to be covering are are kind of more or less common in like an indoor setting or a greenhouse setting or a landscape setting. You tend to see some more or less than others. So we'll we'll try to. Uh, narrow that down a bit when we go down the list. And while you do have experience in a greenhouse setting, spraying mm-hmm. on a, a much larger level, yeah, this will be more focused to probably the average listener, which is dealing with stuff in and or around their house. Yep. And so, and that's what we have a lot of experience talking to people about. I definitely feel comfortable talking to people about what things they can use in their garden space uh, to cr- to control pests and diseases yep and i feel like you do too yep definitely all right so what do you want to talk about first so to give you all kind of a a quick run through of what we're going to cover we're going to break down these sort of by categories from insects to arachnids to fungal diseases bacterial diseases and then uh, molds or water molds because they're all they all kind of have their own little intricacies and they're all relatively common to run into in and around the home as far as that gardening setting and then we'll go through options for both more organic or omri listed pest management options some more on the conventional or synthetic side mm-hmm. as well as some biocontrols sure absolutely and biocontrols are like other insect or mites that can prey on some of these pests Mm -hmm. insects for example um, and take care of them that way without needing to spray any pesticides organic or otherwise yeah so are we gonna touch on or (laughs) 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 so are we gonna touch on insects first or do you want to go into yeah or (laughs) or do you want to go into fungus (laughs) Sorry. I'm just waiting for you to have to edit this until I get to that point. The whole God, time. God the whole time. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so do you want to touch on insecticides or get yeah. into fungicides first? Yeah, let's cover, I feel like insects are probably the biggest category. I would say more often than not, I communicate with people about insects management. Yeah, yeah definitely the most common one to run into. Okay. So which one pisses you off the most? Oh, definitely Western flower thrips or commonly referred to as thrips. Okay. They are pretty widely known as being one of the most destructive greenhouse pests globally. 
and part of that. So thrips are a very, very tiny kind of piercing, sucking insect. That's how they cause damage to the plants. Typically, they're almost like white or. Uh, like, or the, is that the nymph? The nymph is white. The, but the nymph adult is can be like a dark. yellow. Okay. The adult is kind of translucent. That's yellow what it is. gray. Thank you. I yeah. couldn't remember what portion of it was sort of almost this see-through consistency. But they're even the adults are like a, a sixteenth of an inch, right? Like at a, best, like a pencil point or a thick pencil they're, point. They're long and skinny though. Uh, a pencil slash a, a very short thin pencil slash <laughs> the tiniest hyphen that you can right. make with your 0.5 pencil lead yeah. is a thrip so the adults and i believe it's mostly the females that can fly and jump plant to plant gross um so the problem with western flower thrips because they're a piercing sucking insect and not only do they tend to cause physical and and visible damage to a lot of times the newer plant shoots they can also get into the pollen and flower petals and things like that so really like the most attractive parts of your plant the new growth the flowers the pollen those are the areas that they tend to target the most and they like the new growth you know like a lot of other small sucking insects Mm -hmm. they like the new growth because it's getting pushed full of food and water and growth hormones just where all of the good stuff is being shoved into the plant right. also it's much more tender so probably easier for them to penetrate exactly with their little uh, mouth parts yeah and so the problem with them they're extremely tiny they like to hang out and also lay their eggs in those very hard to reach places which makes them very difficult to treat uh, as far as applying insecticides and and getting good contact there. The other problem is um, because of the mobility of the females having wings and being able to travel plant to plant, those females can also lay between 150 and 300 eggs in their lifetime. And their lifetime is about a month plus or minus a few days. And so when that one female can lay up to 300 eggs in that month long period or shorter because their full life cycle from egg to full grown adult, I think is depending on what source you look at, like two to four weeks. So in a very, very short amount of time, that one female can lay up to 300 eggs and then those All eggs those are sexually eggs. mature in in a couple two to four more weeks and so you can start with one pair of thrips a male and a female and in one month that could be tens of thousands of thrips their population just explodes exponentially and between all of those things hiding in the the tighter areas of the plant the rapid population expansion, their mobility, it makes them extremely difficult to treat and control. And then on top of that, when you have a population that explodes that rapidly and can have so many generations in such a short window of time, when you're treating them with a pesticide, it's very easy for them to develop uh, resistance to pesticides, especially if you're using the same chemical multiple applications in a row of the same chemical or only using a couple rotating between the two when you have a few members of that population that can develop a resistance that has been kind of the main problem with keeping them under control in general as a problem for greenhouses because of the rapid expansion sure. combined with multiple generations resistance. can happen in such a short period of time that they're evolving and building up right yeah exactly so, yes, as far as uh, of the insects we're going to cover, the one that you is sound the like you biggest have some nightmare to me. experience dealing with. Yes. They, they definitely you were quick to uh, to jump on the uh, flocks thrips. <laughs> yes. <laughs> to, you were very quick to uh, call out the thrips. Uh, what's your firsthand experience with this, Nick, if <laughs> yes. you don't mind? Thrips in general are quite a dick. <laughs> yeah i mean just about every season you'd see them end up in the greenhouse they can come in on plug and liner anything that's produced from plant cuttings like your liner material for growing out in the greenhouse they could be on those and 
you know, you hope that greenhouses that are supplying those plant starts are treating effectively. But again, they're just so tiny and they can be in all those nooks and crannies. And if you're treating with, say, a systemic insecticide, maybe that systemic isn't quite getting to all of those plant parts that the thrips really enjoy, like the flower and the pollen. It might not be translocating enough to kill off those thrips. So it's very easy to end up getting a few of them in plant material that's being brought in. They can come in from the outside. I mean, screens in your greenhouse or, you know, again, that's a lot of my background with greenhouse production. And if they laid their eggs on something, yeah. maybe the adults are dead on the plant prior to shipping, but the eggs are microscopic. Right. And you're not going to see those necessarily with your naked eye. Right. And a lot of times eggs, I'm not 100% sure with thrips, but I know a lot of times eggs for a lot of different pests are immune to topical sprays. Or like with these thrips, with those eggs being so tiny and often laid in the tiniest little crevices, protected areas of the plant. Right, if the surface contact wasn't made with the insecticide, exactly. that patch is fine. Even if they're using a systemic... The eggs aren't eating the plant. The systemic is only right. effective on, on insects or bugs that are chewing or actively using the plant as a food source, which the eggs are not doing. Right. And a common one of those, and we'll get into that more, is the neonicotinoid or neonic pesticides. So yeah, between their, those eggs are not hatched and active, actively eating the plant, and they're tucked into an area that's not going to get hit by a spray for contact killing it's very easy to bring them in. And same with bringing a houseplant home from your local garden center. Mm -hmm. I had earlier this spring picked up a couple plants for my mom at a garden center in Illinois. And it was a plant that uh, I know they don't grow in house. You know, again, same deal. They could come in even if you're buying a finished ready to sell plant from Florida, California, Arizona, wherever. If that grower had them or if those eggs were on those plants and you bring those in, pretty soon they're going to hatch. And you buy that plant, bring it home and put it next to all your other house plants. You can very quickly end up with an exploding population of thrips because there's no natural predators inside. Kind of same mm -hmm. similar issue to with a greenhouse is there, those predators aren't there to keep that population under control. <laughs> you know, when I was briefly just looking up a couple things as far as refreshing my mind on, you know, what we were talking today. Although for the most part, we're doing this episode just based upon what we already have in the back of our heads at a given moment. But when I was refreshing some uh, control specifically for fungicide, one of the things came up, I forgot to tell you. And of course it was on a dot com. Someone listed that you could vacuum the thrips off <laughs> of, of the foliage. Mm -hmm. um, what do you think about that, Nick? <laughs> yeah, I see a lot of stuff like that or or taking your plant and running it underwater in the shower and uh, I could imagine so so essentially what I was going to ask is like you don't vacuum your plants. You're likely going to cause damage to the plant yeah. and you're just going to look a little it's a little goofy. Yeah. But as far as very, very commonly though I see I see running plants underwater in the shower for aphids or for spider mites and you know, that might work to a degree, but... You might knock off the adults. Yeah. But you may not... You know, it's definitely something if you have good water pressure, you know, to kind of knock off some of the larva or some... Of, it definitely helps reduce the population, but that's certainly not going to entirely control yeah. the population. It's a pretty short-term... But it's, it's certainly fix. the most natural thing right. you could do yeah. to help True. inhibit some of the population, but you'll have to likely use other methods. Right. So yeah, that would definitely be my number one least favorite insect pest. What about you, Ethan? I would probably have to go with mealybug. Mm -hmm. I really don't like mealybug. And mealybug kind of looks like a powdery white. Yeah, so the, the insect itself up close looks like a small white Roly poly, you mm -hmm. know, in in many ways, it's not. Whereas but a roly, very very small, right? Whereas a roly poly is a totally different species of bug. It's not an insect, but just so you can visualize it, it does up close look like it could just be a small isopod. But it is insect, and it and it also can produce this sort of cottony substance around it, and definitely that sometimes that cottony substance can be indicative of 
eggs. You know, sure. they'll kind of put that around as them a protective kind of, barrier. Exactly. Exactly. Mm-hmm. But they do like to cluster. So when you have really bad infestations, you'll have a whole cluster of mealybug together, but they're sneaky little shits and you can kind of, they'll tuck into. Yeah. They'll start out. You'll see a few like powdery white flecks mm-hmm. on your plant. And then pretty soon it's a bigger and bigger and bigger cluster. Yep. And not always present just on the visible leaf parts. No, they'll as you have found. (laughs) Yeah, they'll get they'll be in the nooks and crannies. You know, if you have a palm, they will be in the old growth of the palms that's right there snug up against the trunk. In the roots. Yeah, I found that out with a large yucca that I had. I could not figure out why it kept declining and declining. I couldn't see anything topically on the scion of the plant, anything above ground. And then I pull out the pot and the mealy bug was all over the roots around the side of that pot. Mm -hmm. And at that point I was just like, you know what? Uh Uh-uh. And I threw it out. Yeah. Sometimes when you're, (laughs) when you're so heavily invested with some of these insects, if it's something that's not rare and unusual and terribly expensive, sometimes the best option is to chuck it. Yeah. If it was like some, you know, family heirloom or something that was given to me by someone special, or if it was a $800 house plant, I don't have anything like that, but still, sure, I might be willing to spend some serious time getting it back on track. But mealybug on the roots of your plant, that's that's not an instant thing. That's, uh, that's a beast. That's probably going to take a couple months. I'm sorry. It's just not, yeah. not anywhere remotely close to what I find enjoyable to do as a horticulturist. Right. So it's gone. But yeah, mealybug, and it's also very common in greenhouse settings too. Yep. They love common on tropicals. warm climate and they yep. can survive year round in warm climate. So yeah, you definitely see that a lot on house plants or tropicals. And they will lay their eggs in the soil. So even if you don't see them above ground, you could bring them home. So you could buy them from a garden center, not see anything on them at all. And then all of a sudden you get it home and in a month you have mealybugs on your plant. And it's likely because they had eggs in the soil potentially. Yeah. So mealybug is a huge pain. And anyone who has had mealybug on their plants knows how much of a pain in the butt it is to deal with. And so we'll keep running through some of these pests and then we'll get into in the insect category we'll get into um, management chemical or otherwise for those kind of after this list but speaking of things that can be in the soil fungus gnats Mm -hmm. i also find to be quite a pain yeah and i think they're generally annoying to quite a few people they are aesthetically they're just annoying yes if you've ever had a house plant that uh, you noticed with kind of the damp to moist soil you started getting a lot of these little tiny kind of black little gnat fly looking things those were most likely fungus gnats and they love moist soil conditions when you have moist soil conditions that long-term moist soil right, conditions that encourages them to lay their eggs in the soil, their eggs hatch in the soil, their larvae, which obviously are quite tiny because the fungus gnat itself is like, what, an eighth of an inch or so? It's just a wee little thing. Yeah. yeah. Just enough to kind of buzz around and be annoying. And if you have a glass of water sitting around, they always end up in there. They're mm-hmm. anywhere that there's moisture. They're always checking that A couple out. dirty dishes in your sink. <laughs> right. Yeah. So the problem with fungus gnats is if it's a long term thing and you end up getting a high population in the soil as those larvae are searching for food in the soil that can lead them to eating on the uh, root hairs of your plant. And then once they've eaten on the root hairs of your plant that can leave those roots vulnerable to other pathogens in the soil. And so that's part of how they can be detrimental. On top of just kind of the annoyance of having the adult gnats flying around. And so they they are called fungus gnats because then, like you said, they do. They are attracted to moist soil, not just for a habitable environment for their eggs, but also because usually long term moist soil develops fungus. Mm -hmm. And not only, you know, that fungus isn't necessarily damaging to the roots sometimes it can be if it's overwatered but 
there's still a fungus that will grow in there and is thriving off of the moist decaying matter that that plant is potted in and the larva is eating that fungus but then like you had said in high populations if there's more gnats than there is available fungus then it seems like they will turn their sites onto the root system. Yeah. So in small amounts, in small populations, they're likely not damaging your plant, but in high populations, they're going to cause damage to your plants. Yeah. Hey, Ethan, do you hear that? What? Oh, it's an ad. Real quick, thanks for listening to our episode today. You can stay in touch with us by supporting us on Patreon. We are at patreon.com slash take it or leave it. And we'll have bonus content on Patreon for all of our subscribers there where you can get extra episodes and snippets from the show that we don't release to all the other platforms. You can also find us on Instagram, Facebook, or YouTube at Take It or Leaf It Pod. And you can also visit our website, Take It or Leaf It Pod.com. If you have any questions or comments or any stories you'd like us to research or talk about, or hell, send us a picture of a plant you want us to identify, you can send that information to show at Take It or Leaf It Pod.com. You can also follow us on our individual Instagrams. I am at Hortwise. H-O-R-T-W-I-S-E And I am at N Farringdon N-F-A-R-R-I-N-G-D-O-N Thanks so much. We'll get back to the episode. Oh, you got me. (laughs) Scale. Scale, yep. Ugh. Yep. (sighs) Scale I find not as prevalent in some houseplants. You do see it. Like I've definitely had it on, like I had it on an adenium of mine, Mm -hmm. uh, which is a desert rose. I've had it on prickly pear. Yeah, prickly pear. Yep. But you will find it on a big one. It's a very, it's a different species, but magnolia scale. Mm-hmm. And when you see that, man, is that freaking nasty. I've seen it on, do you remember those Swiss stone pines we had out at the nursery? Oh, yeah. The scale was so bad on these Swiss stone they pines. They looked like they were flocked. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It looked like they had been lightly snowed on in summer. And I think there was someone that we had worked, that we were working with. Like This is what I remember. Correct me if I'm wrong. That told us, oh, no, it's just the sap that is oozing from the the excessive sap buildup. Nope. And upon further, exp- uh, you know, examination, like, no, not sap. Definitely scale. Really bad. <laughs> really bad scale. And scale is generally an armored insect. insect. They can vary quite a bit in size. I've seen some funky tropical versions come up on plant material from Florida that were close to a quarter inch and quite raised. Magnolia can sca- magnolia scale can be really big. It almost yeah. looks like a shell noodle, you yeah. know, <laughs> macaroni shell noodle on your plants. But they're, they're generally, and there's hard and soft scale, but um, mm-hmm. generally it's an armored insect. So when the females, is it just, I think the females and males both have wings for a short amount of time, but once the females get to their main plant where they're going to post up and mate and lay eggs and feed on the plant, they then lose their wings and essentially adhere themselves to the surface of that plant. Right. And, and then, then at that scale, which is like a shield. Yeah. Uh, it's a very yeah. hard protective layer. Yeah. And vision, you know, you put uh, put an apple on your counter and then put a bowl over that apple. Yeah. That is now your visual of what a scale is. You know, the yeah. apple is the the insect with the legs underneath it. And that bowl is that shell that this now has that protects it mm-hmm. um, from all kinds of things, all kinds of environmental factors. Or if you're ever making pasta, like the little shells, mm-hmm. and you're stirring it with a spoon, and the and the shells stick to your spoon, mm-hmm. that's what it reminds. And they yes. won't come off. Yeah, it's it's kind of like that. Yep. Yeah. Yep. And so I always see that too. I'm glad you brought that up because yeah. I, whenever I see that on like the the spoon or the rubber spatula. I always think of scale. Yeah. It's like, oh, that looks like scale on a magnolia. Gross. <laughs> but so that hard outer layer makes them somewhat difficult to treat with pesticides because a contact spray can sometimes take a few applications to get to them. And also tough for biological um, yeah. control as well. Like, yeah. you know, other insects eating them. That's part of what they've developed that for. Yeah. But we'll get into control later. 
Yeah. So yeah, so they have that initial mobility with the wings, but then once the the females are posted up there, they're kind of there to stay. Yeah. And you can get that population again. They're a piercing sucking insect as well. Mm-hmm. And usually when an insect is uh, got a, is a piercing method, mouth parts or proboscis, they're piercing just into the cambium layer of that plant, which is the phloem and xylem layer. And so they're getting direct access to the food. It's essentially the nutrient highway. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, the water is transferring from the roots to the leaves and food is transferring from the leaves to the roots. Mm-hmm. Um, and they are just tapping right into that. So when you have minor insect, you know, that's it's normal. It's very normal to have insects in your garden. It's very normal to have insects that are feeding on your plants in your garden. It's when they get out of control right. that usually damage, you know, a few scale on a plant, not going to kill it. An infestation is going to see some serious declines. Yeah. So, because they're causing physical, you know, it's a, a visual kind of a cosmetic damage in small amounts, but then mm-hmm. of course gets to be more of a problem when they're kind of sapping that that water and nutrients out of that plant. Yeah. So we got, of course, aphids, and what we got, white fly too. Yeah, aphids. Actually, aphids popped up in conversation earlier this week. I had been talking to one of my family members out in Seattle. He and I had been briefly discussing this past week's episode. And he kind of mentioned, hey, on the topic of plant related things, one of my plum trees has had some kind of puckering, curling distortion of its leaves. Um, And he was kind of describing that to me. And I said, you know, if you got a chance, shoot me some pictures. And the first thing that he sent the picture of was actually what ended up being one of the larval stages of a ladybug. And they're kind of a, what, Mm. quarter, quarter inch or slightly bigger, depending on the stage Mm -hmm. that they're in. More usually orange. Yeah, black and and orange. Before they turn that red color. Yeah, black and orange and, and spiky. They don't look anything like a ladybug. Right. And so he sent me that and I said, okay, so that is that is a ladybug larva. So those are good to keep around. And usually indicative of? Of an aphid population yeah. because aphids are uh, ladybug larvas' of favorite food. Mm-hmm. So when I saw that, I go, if you can, send me some more additional photos and as it turned out, yes, those leaves and stems on those the new growth of that plum tree, which as you and I know, plums are ornamental or fruiting or both, are often very susceptible to a wide range of insect pests. But when he sent that picture, yes, there were a fair amount of aphids around, but there were a lot of ladybug larvae around. And I said, you know... Leave them be. Yeah, you, with the amount of ladybug larvae that are there you probably really don't need to worry about spraying right now you're gonna kill all the ladybugs right and in his reading he had seen i think he had been familiar with use of neem and so he mentioned you know maybe i'll give him a shot of neem and i said well hey you know if you do spray with that neem and we'll get into this a little bit more later in the episode but a lot of people tend to think that the organic... This is a semi-regular conversation yeah. I have with patrons in garden centers. Yeah, a lot of people, and there's a lot of really bad information about organic use pesticides on the internet that kind of implies that since they're organic and they're safe for us, they're somehow also safe to use around beneficial insects and pollinators like ladybugs, praying mantis, butterflies, bees, all those beneficials. But just because they're organic does not mean that they are are species specific. They're generally all broad spectrum Mm -hmm. uh, insecticides. So even if you're using a neem or an insecticidal soap or any of the pyrethrins or permethrin, things like that, that that can be listed for organic use, you are still going to also kill off those beneficial insect populations. So you told them, don't contact. spray. And if there's that many larvae on there, they're right. already on it. So they know right. they've picked up on it. Just let nature do its thing. Yeah. And he had kind of said like, hey, that's good to know because a lot of these sites, which as you and I know, we hear it all. Probably a lot of dot coms. Yep. Yeah. A lot of dot coms that say somehow this is fine to kill your pest insect, but not going to kill the insects you want to keep around. And that's just not the case. 
Yeah. This is very false information. Yeah. If you are. Yeah. Yeah. And we'll get we'll get more into that. So you told your uncle not to spray. Let the ladybugs do their thing. But yeah, aphids, they can really they can do damage. They can yep. warp the new growth. They love that. They can grow. And there's yeah, they different love colors. orange that aphids. succulent new growth. Yeah, there's green aphids. Lots of black s- aphids, lots of plant, woolly aphids, plant species specific aphids. Correct. And one way that you can tell if you're looking at an aphid, if you're able to get up close enough and use like a little magnifying glass or take a picture and zoom in, is they have these two little kind of spikes on their back end, on their abdomen that kind of point out away from opposite direction of their head. And those little spiky nodules are associated to an aphid in specific. So if you see that you know that you have an aphid. And they're generally kind of oval-ish shape or like kind of roughly shaped like a like a sesame seed, but rounded. Yeah, yeah, like a, yeah, sesame seed is a good yeah. one. And they can vary in size too. I mean, you could have little tiny guys up to what, probably quarter inch if you include antenna. I guess. It's a big aphid. Maybe not quite. Maybe like a eighth, eighth more eighth. commonly. Yeah, an so under. Like an eighth of an inch. Yeah. Something like a, yeah, like a little small seed or something of yeah. like a poppy seed. Yellow, green, black, gray, white. Mm-hmm. Yeah, like you mentioned the woolly aphids, they could look like a little puff of cotton floating around in the wind. And when you get close, it's actually a little winged aphid floating around. And so sometimes, like you said, if you notice a bunch of ladybug larvae and or ladybugs on your plant, mm-hmm. look for aphids. Also, if you're seeing a boatload of ants. Mm-hmm. On your plant, that could also be a sign that you have aphids because ants like to harvest aphids. Yeah, they kind of farm them. They which do. Is very interesting, <laughs> fascinating to watch. I like it. I I I don't mess with them when I see that because I just find that a very fun thing. Ants can be kind of a pain in the butt though because ants aren't eating the aphids. Like you they said, eat. they're farming yeah. them. They they take their antenna and they tickle, they, they, they tap, tap, tap and tickle on the ant's little abdomen and it encourages the, uh, or the aphid's abdomen and it encourages the aphids to produce what's called honeydew, which yep. is excrement yep. from what they are getting out of the plant. And, and that's a good f- indicator too, if you have aphids on a plant, especially in high concentrations, you'll kind of see... Sticky substance. Yeah, it's like a clear, shiny, sticky look, almost like if somebody took a spray bottle and just gave a quick mist to your plant, except it's kind of a sticky, tacky, clear liquid. And then sometimes sooty mold will grow on mm-hmm. that, which is a black sticky substance or mm-hmm. possibly sticky because of the honeydew stickiness already. But and those sooty nutrients. mold likes to eat the um, or to thrive on the honeydew as well. But it's called honeydew because it's it's supposed to be sweet. I haven't tried it myself. <laughs> um, but the ants. I mean, you're a leaf licker. So. Yeah, right. Yeah. Uh, you'd think I would have tried it by now. But the uh, so the ants will kind of encourage heavy feasting and then essentially tickle and massage the aphids to get them to to produce more of this honeydew and then they eat it right up and they just eat honeydew which yep. is aphid poo yep. and that's the world we live in guys yeah it's a very interesting kind of symbiotic relationship with the ants and then what the ants then do also is they're protecting the aphids so They will kill or fight other insects that might feed on those aphids Mm -hmm. like lace wings or mantids or ladybugs. Those ants are now protecting those aphids. So also Mm -hmm. another interesting thing Mm -hmm. that's happening is so certainly if you see the ants on there, they're not controlling the aphids. But it is still really cool to see. Like there's sometimes I'll get like weedy poplar trees that just pop up out of nowhere. And aphids love that new fresh growth on a poplar tree. Mm -hmm. Um, And I've seen it several times. I have pictures and videos on my phone uh, and where the ants just kind of completely you have this big black stem because the ants are all over this little poplar new growth. And then towards the upper quarter of that new shoot is where all the aphids are. And the ants are just farming them like, hey, do your thing. We want your your booty brew, you know, so your honeydew booty brew. (laughs) (laughs) 
but yeah, really cool thing. So they'll also do the same thing uh, moving on. They'll do the same thing with whitefly larva. So mm. whitefly larva can also be damaging to plants. Um, not so much the adults. It's more so the larva. And they can cause a lot of aesthetic damage. They're not as big of an issue in small numbers. And they're kind of the adults are a teeny, a pure white, beady fly. Yep. It, it looks like it could be a gnat, mm-hmm. um, but a it, pure white. Right. Instead of the black fungus gnat. Mm-hmm. And they are usually smaller yep. um, than the fungus gnat. But yeah, those in large numbers can cause serious problems. And they're also a suckering insect easy to spot the adults you got to near the plants and, and the plants ruffled, got ruffled and yep. off you see these little these little white flecks flying around so from the naked eye because all of these are small and so if you're curious you can't quite tell from the naked eye if you're looking at an aphid infestation or a thrip infestation one way to kind of narrow it down like you just said ruffle the foliage and if you see white flies coming out of it that's what you got Yep. And but th- they can also produce honeydew from what they're doing. So ants will do the same thing with white flies as they do with aphids, where they will protect them and form this relationship with them, where they're now harvesting the white fly honeydew, and then in exchange protecting those white fly larvae from other naturally occurring pests or naturally occurring biocontrols. And another sign with both jumping back a little too with the aphids is as those aphids go through their life cycle stages and they molt into larger sizes. Oh, you'll see that on the leaves. Those, yeah, because you have that sticky substance on those leaves, as the aphids molt, those little those little aphid husks will get stuck on Mm -hmm. that honeydew. And so that can be another indicator that you have something going on. Yeah. So that's kind of a good rundown of probably what people would commonly Mm -hmm. see on their plants. Mm -hmm. Anything else you can think of? Um, One I saw recently, which I feel like has been around a little more often, I see more in landscape, is the boxwood leaf miner. Oh, good call. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A lot of people have boxwoods. They're kind of the new you of the, what, 70s? Yeah, whereas the yew was such a common evergreen, yeah, planted in the 50s, 60s, 70s, I would say the boxwood... 80s 90s to more recently yeah Yeah. so the boxwood leaf miner the damage is caused by the larva yes and being a leaf miner what happens is those adults lay their eggs between the layers of the leaf correct Mm -hmm. and so when those eggs hatch those little larvae and they're kind of what an orangey yellow little it looks like a little tiny little worm yep and so it's often you can see it on your boxwoods, usually more on the new growth or what was the the most recent growth from the previous year. And it'll present as like some curling of the leaf or you'll see kind of some yellow splotching of the leaf, like something doesn't look quite right. And they almost, the leaf almost has a little bit of a, a puff to it rather than being an, a flat succulent leaf. Or sometimes you will see an actual like bug trail Ch- edible yeah, a little channel in the leaf. And a couple ways to notice them when the adults are around. Again, if you ruffle the leaves of that boxwood and you see kind of some little orangish flies flying around the plants, that's typically an adult version of the boxwood leaf miner. Also curled cupping, mm-hmm. canoeing, yep. tacoing, whatever verb you or, you know, whatever you want to use to describe it. If the leaf is cupping or canoeing, mm-hmm. that can also be a sign or indicative of leaf miners. And when you take those affected leaves and you kind of tear them in half, especially if it's that season's leaf miners, you can often tear them in half and see that there's that air pocket, that air cavity in Sometimes the leaf. Sometimes the seed or the, I'm sorry, the egg is still there. Or the the larva yep. often I'll find. They're just in there crawling around, munching away, eating at the, the insides of that leaf. With those, unfortunately, you sort of would have to treat early with a systemic. But if you treat before that shrub blooms with a systemic, that chemical will also kill any beneficial pollinators going to the flowers of the boxwood plant. 
when it's in bloom. So that is something to be aware of. Um, sure. If you can, if you're going to treat them with a systemic to do so after that plant has flowered. And depending on the the dilution that you are making your systemic, uh, systemic being something that the plant is going to absorb and hold on to internally, mm-hmm. whether through the roots or straight through the foliage a lot of times it's through the roots depending on how strong you've made it or how strong the chemical is that you are using it could retain that chemical for upwards of a year Mm -hmm. so it could even if you wait until after it's flowered you might still have residual of that by the time it is flowering again so something you have to use in your own best judgment Mm -hmm. you know we're not going to tell you what to do in your own garden space, but at least give you some of the, you know, what you would need to know about what you're doing. Yeah. One more thing we didn't write down, bagworms. Ooh, yeah, bagworms. So if you've had a... We should also throw in a note, there are a lot of garden insect pests. Oh, man, we could keep going going and going and going. But we're just kind of hitting a few of the biggest ones that are most common around and now depending on you know when we get this episode out it could be you know a week from now from our recording of this episode but june is a great time to be prepared at least in the midwest to be prepared to spray for bagworms yep bagworms if you you might be familiar with them already if you've had uh, an evergreen in your yard they very much like spruces and false cypress um, arborvitae. arborvitae, sometimes junipers. I've also seen them on other things that are not evergreen. I've seen mm-hmm. them decimating a dogwood shrub before. Sure. So what they do, they're very clever. This is the time or close to the time that they will be actively in worm stage. Yeah, they're um, like a little black yep. worm. Yep. And they are going to be munching and eating things along around the plant while also simultaneously keeping some of that material that they're eating and using their silk that they produce and kind of creating this little um, cone. Yeah. Yeah. It looks to the naked eye to an, or to, I should say to an untrained eye when you see it in its final form, it looks like it could be like a small cone, a pine cone, Mm -hmm. a little like what under an inch. I would say sometimes they can be bigger than that. I would say the egg sacs. Oh, I was talking about the formed, the full formed, cocoon that they create of eggs for the next year yeah yeah i was i'm talking about the little cone that they hide themselves with on their butt yeah 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 that's oh. i'd say in full formed i've seen them two inches really oh i've seen some big old honkers huh. so so you know usually in the ballpark of like a sharpie's width in diameter and then i've seen them anywhere between an inch to two inches long mm, mm-hmm, um mm-hmm. sometimes even bigger than that i've seen some real big ones mm. but yeah those are once they're in that stage and they're fully sealed off and hanging usually they're usually hanging on the the branches of whatever they've been munching on not really much you can do outside of pull them off and dispose of them yeah when you have that what looks like a couple inch long little pine coney looking thing that they build with their as you said with their silk and the plant material that they've used to disguise themselves with cultural control is definitely the best method in the off season if you see those little cones hanging from your plant of them yeah just pluck them off and throw them in the trash or burn them yep but while they are active which is pretty soon if not now for some people now is the time to spray them uh, and spray your tree and one of the things you can use is called spinosad it's an organic spray that you can use. It's a type of bacillus. Essentially a bacterial derivative. Correct. That specifically targets certain larvae. Not everything. Mm-hmm. It's not necessarily going to go after bee larvae. Yeah, uh, typically chewing insect like worms and caterpillars. Right, is usually what this controls. Uh, now it can affect other things like in the leptor, leptor, leptor lepidoptera lep lepter the oh caterpillars lepidopter oh damn it hold please lepidoptera i was right oh, okay. oh sweet <laughs> all right yeah so it couldn't affect other things in the lepidopter family so other beneficial caterpillars mm-hmm. spinosad may affect now usually though on like a juniper or an arborvitae there's likely not too many 
that's not a host plant for a swallowtail or a monarch or anything like that. Right. So, but just something to also be aware of as you're spraying it is that it it even though it is more targeted, it can still affect beneficials. And BT is another one that you could use for that type of of chewing insect. Yes, and that's the Bacillus thuringiensis. Yep. So that is a type of bacteria that essentially impacts the gut biome of mm-hmm. those caterpillars or worms and then kills them through that method. Yeah. So, yeah, those are some of the the quick insect, you know, things that you might encounter. So now that we've given you all some of the more common pest insect varieties that we come across, we'll jump back a little bit and describe some of the best options as far as uh, how to kill them. Yeah, as treatments for those. And again, this list will comprise of both organic or OMRI listed options, synthetic or conventional chemical options, and then also some biocontrols as far as having live biological insects to combat your pest insects. Yeah. Uh, So one of the ones that I would use quite a bit, and this will actually fall under treatments for some of our other categories of pests that we'll get into, is insecticidal soap. Sure. Depending on what brand you buy, generally they're pretty much recommended for organic use, if not OMRI listed for organic use. And that's kind of an independent certification for organic chemical and other media, plant medias. And insecticidal soap is just that. It looks essentially like a a kind of very viscous, yellow, transparent liquid and that you dilute down and it is a contact insecticide. So you have to use spray directly on your target pest. Most sprays are, I would yep. say. Yeah, I would say your average spray, especially anything you're going to buy over the counter is contact kill. Yep. Not a preventative measure. It's definitely worth clarifying. You can't just spray your plant right. and then think, oh, it's safe for this whole week. Right. That's not how they work. And a lot of these that are contact sprays, you you generally have to do some number of follow-up applications to kind of get those residuals, whether it's eggs that are still present on the plant or present in the soil or, or things like that. So often one shot and done doesn't quite cut it, whether it's organic or synthetic, uh, either or. But insecticidal soap, generally safe on most plants. I think there are some palms, some ferns, maybe a handful of begonias, I think, or a handful of annuals. Off the top of my head, I want to say maybe impatience and begonias, certain varieties of those that could be more sensitive. Okay. Um, But, you know, as always with any of these, definitely read the label because there are some things that will have a negative effect on that plant that you're spraying on. Sure. But insecticidal soap, I've used that for aphids, thrips. You could use it for contact for the adult fungus gnats. I believe it's rated for scale, mealybug. Again, some of those that have those protective coatings like scale and mealybugs can be a little more tricky to treat. And uh, this is in another category, but you can also treat it, uh, use it to treat spider mites, which we'll get into those a little bit later, as well as some fungal infections, which we'll cover later. Do you want to get into... My favorite is pyrethrin. Yeah. Pyrethrin is a natural substance. It is derived from things in the chrysanthemum family. There are synthetics that you can buy. Permethrin or pyrethroids yep. are synthetic variants of pyrethrin or pyrethrum. Yep. And pyrethrum is essentially what pyrethrins come from. So if you see yep. pyrethrin or you see pyrethrum, it's interchangeable. Yeah. And pyrethrins that, are like the active ingredient. Correct. And those are things that are extracted from the family of chrysanthemums, which is a type of flower. Right. And this insecticide, I do recommend, it's a little bit more expensive, but I I think getting anything with the active ingredient of pyrethrin or pyrethrum is going to be more effective than the synthetic permethrins or pyrethroids. Anyway, those are effective on a broad level of of things. Similar to insecticidal soap. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I've even used in the treat some real tough ones like squash bugs, which if you've ever tried to grow a melon or a squash in your vegetable garden, 
Those might be something that is a yearly visitor to your garden. Mm-hmm. And uh, pyrethrin, while they are tough and you know would require multiple applications, I have used pyrethrins to at least get a handle on squash bugs. Yeah. But I like it. It's it's a spray. It's a contact kill only as well. It's non-selective. So just about whatever you spray it on, it is likely going to yeah. kill. Yeah, especially arthropods. Yeah. Right. So be conscientious as to when you spray that. Now, because it is contact kill only, I usually recommend when people use it is to find what is bothering their plant and then spray them directly as opposed to broadcast spraying the mm-hmm. plant because anything that's beneficial that lands on it, that interacts with it, uh, especially that gets their mouth part on the pyrethrin could be negatively impacted by it. Mm-hmm. Uh, so just something to keep in mind, you know, use it in the evenings too. You know, if you can't find the pest that is chewing on your plant, there's, you know, sometimes some of these insects, these chewing insects come out at night because there's less predators. So you might benefit from spraying in the evening or early, early morning before your, like your bees, for example, are real active. early morning. Yep. Like we're talking like five, yeah, six, five o'clock. six o'clock when everything is kind of dewy and damp and all the flying pollinators aren't active yet. And, and those and, pest insects are, you can kind of get them with a shot there. And by the time the pollinators come out, those residues have dried and they're not going to be as damaging to your it, beneficials. It does have a short half-life. Yeah. So especially in sun, it does not last long. So when right. you spray it on your plant, it does break down pretty quickly, especially the more sunlight it's in. Yeah. So at least it's not something that's long-term lasting on your plants. Yeah, the pyrethrins, I think. So something to note for a lot of these liquid chemicals, insecticidal soap, pyrethrins, some others that we're going to mention particularly for the pyrethrins, like you said, the half-life is extremely short. So a lot of these liquid chemicals, you really only want to mix up the amount of chemical that you're going to use on that given day. Right. Yeah, I think for pyrethrins, I think the half-life in sunlight is like eight hours. Right. So now it's okay like if you buy it in a bottle that's not sun permeable. Mm -hmm. Like it's usually when you buy it ready to use, it's in a gray or a blue something or a green. totally opaque right but if you mix it up at your house in your own pump sprayer which a lot of times are clear mm-hmm. it's not going to last long and also with a lot of these liquid chemicals on top of having a shorter half-life once they're mixed especially if they're going to be exposed to sunlight you also as far as storage of those chemicals don't want to store them above really above like 80 degrees so if you're keeping your pesticides really of any kind in your garage or in your shed it's not insulated right and that's getting hot in the summer or cold in the winter the efficacy of those chemicals is going to be drastically reduced so you really want to keep that in a temperature controlled environment of course somewhere that kids and pets can't access it but that's generally pretty applicable to most liquid pesticides. Yeah. So sometimes I tell people like people will leave it in their garages that have no insulation. Or in your hot car. Right. Yeah. You know, it's just like, and they've had it for years and like, you're not, you're yeah. not doing anything. You might as well be just spraying water on the plant. Right. Or you've, you're spraying a chemical on your plant that's just going to harm the plant because it's not the Who same knows what it's anymore. broken down to. So yeah. if it's. If it's easy for you, if you don't have an insulated garage or you know that your garage gets really hot or really cold, if you can store this in your basement, these chemicals in your basement or under your kitchen sink, something like that, you know, would be you have more longevity out of that uh, chemical. And another one I think you threw the name out of, neem, is pretty common as well. And again, that's another one that's on... Azadiractin, is that what that is? Yes, azadiractin is the active chemical. Most commonly you see it listed as neem. If you're buying like a really good... This is from a tree. Like green, yeah. I think, is it the seeds of a tree in Africa? I can't I think remember it's ex- exactly what it's expelled from. I think from, it's expeller press from, from the seeds of some kind of tree. Now, neem... 
like you mentioned, Ethan, the azadiractin is that most active ingredient. So if you're buying a high quality for horticultural or greenhouse use neem product, it will be listed as the active ingredient as azadiractin. If you're buying something that just says neem, chances are you're not getting like a very high quality, high potency option. It's usually option. very low. Yeah. yeah. And you can end up paying a lot of money like a sometimes a quart of azadiractin like the concentrate i mean you could pay over a hundred dollars for a quart of this stuff it neem is one of those things that circulates on the internet all the time as like, as like use it for everything yeah. yeah it's like this cure-all for everything for your plant and like you just said when you're just buying something that says neem on it right you're usually buying a low quality or a it's been highly diluted right uh to the point where and if it's not refined, it's like you're not really getting that active chemical that you want. Right. And so while it might be somewhat effective in small for small fleshy insects in small populations or as a very, very, very minor miticide or fungicide, yeah. it's not going to be terribly effective. And depending on if you are getting one of those higher quality versions that are as a direct and specifically it can have a broad uh, sure. bacterial, fungal, insecticidal uses, certainly. But again, you're going to be spending more for that refined product. Um, Just like with pyrethrin, you will spend more on pyrethrin than you will on permethrin. Right. But pyrethrin is more effective. Right. And that's because it's naturally derived from that plant, has a broader range of active chemicals within that right. compound exactly. than, than the synthetic version. So again, neem typically is sold for organic use as a more natural product. Uh, sometimes you see it listed, OMRI listed. Again, that's going to be more your higher quality options like the azadiractin. And something of note, if you spray neem on an active insect pest population, you're not going to see an instant knockdown of that pest. And that is because the mode of action is different than some of these others that we've talked about. And that's important too to note when going into something for pest management as far as treating those pests because not all of these chemicals interact with those insects in the same way. Insecticidal soap, for example, is essentially a acts as a nerve agent. It can penetrate the shell, say you're spraying it on uh, Japanese beetles. Right. It can penetrate that shell. They spasm. Affects their nervous system. Die. And you'll see like 80 or higher percent instant knockdown. V very soon. Yeah. yeah. We, I mean, we've seen that. We have right. actively seen that where right. we've watched after we spray Japanese beetles with insecticidal soap. Right. And, and then, they tend to drop pretty quickly. Yeah, within a couple minutes. Whereas neem, and I, I get the benefits of neem, especially when it's in the form of azadiractin, but while it does have those many benefits, as far as treating insect pests, it does take longer to work because the mode of action of azadiractin in neem is as an insect growth regulator. And mm -hmm. so what, what happens there is when those insects go to their next life cycle stage, it prevents them from properly completing that stage. So say... They kind of die in the metamorphosis stage. Right. So, so say that aphid is morphing into a larger adult phase. When it goes to make that shift the neem prevents that and they die through that stage. It's so like when you get home from work and you're taking your pants off and then you just get stuck and you die. Right. <laughs> yes. <laughs> that's one way to think about it. <laughs> yeah, that's, yeah, we'll leave that example. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so you're not going to see that immediate knockdown. It does take a little while. So in the interim, you could have, you know, like uh, like that family member I mentioned who was trying to treat the or, or thinking about treating the aphids on the plum tree. Had they sprayed that those ladybugs? The One, the ladybugs, when those the went into their next stage to, to turn into an adult ladybug, they would die there. But all, the same situation with the aphids and you're not going to see that immediate knockdown. So in the meantime, they're going to continue eating, sucking away at that plum tree. There's a product. I'm going to just say it just even though we're not getting a plug for it. Maybe we'll down the road though. But the insecticide that I like to use with pyrethrin in it is triple action, mm. the fertilone product. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And triple action has both 
pyrethrin and neem. Mm -hmm. So those are the both the active ingredients in this. And so it's kind of hitting that it's getting that instant kill from the pyrethrin Mm -hmm. and then whatever isn't getting instantly killed for whatever reasons, the neem oil is acting as that. And um, what's the third? Is there like some BT? Mm -mm. So there's only two chemicals in triple action? Trip, it's called triple <laughs> it's called triple action because it's sold as an insecticide miticide and a uh, fungicide that's right okay and because neem because neem can be fungicidal yeah it's yeah. very low concentration yeah. of neem but i think if you had like a mild fungus like powdery mildew i've um, seen it things would be with okay. uh, pyrethrin insecticidal soap is sold in that kind of with that kind of wording too because insecticidal soap can be kind of a fungicide mm, okay a bit especially for powdery mildew yeah which we'll get into in a bit mm-hmm. so then another so we we kind of touched on spinosad i brought up spinosad with the yep. spinosad um, and bt yeah for controlling things like um bagworms also any kind of pest caterpillar mm-hmm, mm-hmm, army worms or leaf miners it can affect it's just leaf miners are harder to get because they're inside, inside the leaf. leaf yeah Shoot, what is that other one you know the one that can create those those webby nests around tent caterpillars thank you yep. gosh tent caterpillars yeah, if, you're, if you're ever driving down the highway and you see these big clusters of webbing in the trees usually like on the ends of yep. trees where like the, kind new, of the growth new growth is yep that can have dozens if not hundreds of caterpillars oh, in there disgusting and fascinating at the same time <laughs> when you they, look inside those they just devastate the new growth on those areas and they're protected by all that webbing mm-hmm. yeah so sometimes you have to like really soak the webbing or if you can reach it snip them off and at that point by the time them. you're usually seeing all of that webbing yeah. on the plant that growth is just yeah it's totally floxed yeah. So you might as well just get rid of it. Yep. Yeah. Cultural control or physically removing that affected area and that pest can sometimes be the best best mm-hmm. option if, if you can reach it. Right. Yeah. So what we have, uh, we touched on pyrethrin, we touched on insecticidal soap, we got spinosad BT covered. I think the only other... What other organic do we have? We have a couple other more natural products. One would be milky spore. Which would be something that would be more for ground usage Mm -hmm. to get rid of uh, larvae in the soil, like grubs. Which then turn into Japanese beetles. Or sometimes June bugs or June beetles. Mm -hmm. But those grubs will come to the surface, usually in spring, to feast on the roots of your grass commonly or other things in your garden. So they'll be laid, those eggs will be laid from the beetle in fall. And then that larva, the egg will hatch and then move down in, in the soil to be protected from the cold weather. And then as it warms up, that larva crawls back up to the surface. And to finish its final metamorphosis stage, it's eating the new roots of things that are coming back to life that are just full of nutrients. Mm-hmm. So milky spore is a way to it takes a while to get established in your garden. And it's a it needs a food source. It's a bacterial culture as well, right? Isn't it fungus? Oh, spore. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah, spore. Oh, it's in the name. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Good. Yeah. Good. Good. It's, it's fungus. Yeah. So it's it's but it does stay persistent in the soil for a while. It, yeah. It can if there's not a food source. Right. It can slowly die off. So if you've spread milky spore, and like I said, it takes a while to really colonize in your yard. It's not instant gratification. It can take two, three, sometimes longer to really get going in your yard. And usually applied either as a granular that you can put in a spreader or as a powder. Yes. Yeah. That you sprinkle across your whole yard. It does tend to be more expensive than a conventional, like a grub X or some conventional chemical that's a granular that you spread to kill the grubs in your yard. But I think the longevity in the right conditions is probably worth the extra cost. Mm Mm-hmm diatomaceous earth diatomaceous earth yeah that's yeah. a good one or diaper dust diapel yeah Di- diapel think, Di- diaper diaper dust diaper dust. Well, <laughs> once that's what helps me you know not get <laughs> rashy in this season when you're walking around fifteen thousand steps and you're <laughs> a big guy like me so you need that not, diaper dust not to be confused with talcum powder even <laughs> uh <laughs> diatomaceous earth 
usually com- it comes as a powder. Yeah. Usually in a bottle with a little nozzle that you you kind of puff, puff around, and it is mainly meant for. A lot of times I'll see people use it for slugs and snails and other kind of soft bodied insects or mollusks. Yeah. A lot of times you can sprinkle it out around your plants and your squash and your veggies and your hostas, anything that would get nibbled on at night by those kind of critters. And to us, it's a powder, but to them, uh, you can sort of think of it as walking or, or slithering around if you're a snail on broken glass, essentially. Same with diatomaceous earth. Oh, yeah. That's what we're talking about. <laughs> I thought you switched to dipel dust. That's diatomaceous earth. Shut up. Dipel, dipel dust is a just a commercial name for diatomaceous earth. If I knew that. I yeah. did not retain that. Mm. I've always in the rare situation, usually I've seen or interact with diatomaceous earth. Mm-hmm. I've only seen dipel dust occasionally, but I've always talked about it and encouraged the use in the exact same way that you would use diatomaceous earth, but almost as if they're the same. <laughs> yeah. And the moment that we were recording this, that left my brain or was never in. my brain. Uh, I mean, I could be wrong. You should look it up just to be sure. <laughs> Cause now I'm questioning everything. Oh, Sage. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, Google diatomaceous earth. Just search dipel. If the active is, is diatomaceous earth, then we know. Ah, they are different. Really? Di- the active ingredient in dipel dust is BT. Oh. Yeah. Look, we're both learning with our audience. Wow. An active bacteria that is dead. Okay, well, yeah, we already talked about that. So, yeah, dipel dust is a biological insecticide. So, yeah, mm. dipel dust is BT. Just a dry powder form of BT. Good thing we're talking about something that neither one of us know sage about. Well... I always saw them, they're generally always together right. when you'd see them in a garden center. And dipel, diatomaceous earth, that's not a stretch. No. Interesting. Uh, so, Are yeah. they ever combined? Uh, I would imagine, I wonder if, if they were combined, I would think that what diatomaceous earth is would be harmful to the bacteria. There's nothing for the bacteria to thrive on. But I guess it's it's applied in a dormant stage that is reactivating. I would imagine that the BT is is in a dormant stage and then activating upon interacting with something that it, that you no know, because it's eaten. That's what happens yeah. with BT is it's right. eaten by the the insect and then causes damage internally. Right. But I don't know what you know in diatomaceous earth is a very different substance as a type of pulverized ground rock material and that is what you were just talking about is like us walking through glass would be what diatomaceous earth is to a lot of larva Uh, also if they happen to ingest it it's would be like us eating glass (laughs) but generally the purpose is you're sprinkling it around and it's more or less making a perimeter around those plants that that your target pest is going to cross paths with and meet a gruesome demise. Yeah. Yeah. Diatomaceous is a naturally occurring um, rock that is then powdered or pulverized. And then you sprinkle that on the plant or around the base of the affected plant, And then insects or creepy crawlies interact with it and ouchie. So interesting. Very good to know. I had always both seen learned those, about dipel dust. Yep. I had always seen those sold right next to each other at garden centers. Both are a white powder and I apparently just never retain that. That's okay. Hmm. See, it's a humble moment for us yep. as a horticulturist. You are never always a know learning. it all. Absolutely. Yep. Absolutely. So we didn't get to this point where we felt like we could talk to people because we always knew everything. Yep. Although we probably should should know we know more than we don't i think that's also false (laughs) uh for like like i know the most like commonly occurring things i feel like we're very very solid on and then probably too much obscure stuff as well yeah but broader across horticulture yeah always always learning yeah Yeah. so anyway so yeah we just learned about the diaper dust perfect So that kind of wraps up controls, non-living controls. 
That wraps up the more natural and or organic routes. Then we do have a handful of the more common ones that are your more synthetic or conventional. Um, Like we briefly mentioned the neonicotinoid or neonic pesticides, and those are your systemic insecticides. Common one being imidacloprid. Yep. That's that's generally the one you're going to see the most. There was a in brief- any of the tree and shrub protect or right. three in one rose protect anything that's it's all midacloprid. Yeah. Anything that's advertised to protect your plants from insects for An a number of months. period of time. Right, yep, right, right. Exactly. There was a brief period of time when uh, for the ash borer, when it was really becoming a problem for homeowners, when mm-hmm. it's kind of moved out of the wooded areas and the ash borer was finding the other ashes that were now planted in people's yards and decimated As it them. still does today. Oh, yeah, yeah. They're, they're definitely on their way out. And I know there's some people here who are still really fighting, trying to keep them alive, but, you know. You can just treat that tree every single year. That's pretty much all you're going to be able to do is, yep. as at this point, that ash borer, it just eats ash. Yeah. And you so have to as keep that the, chemical persistently present in the tree, essentially, at all times that that larva could be present. Exactly, uh, which is at all times. <laughs> right. So there was a time when when we both were instructed at a, uh, we even had a rep come out for this particular company educating us to educate customers about applying imidacloprid as a way to control these ash borers in their ash trees. Which Only the, the adult is a bright, shiny, emerald green. Something like a coppery insect. flare. Yeah. Yep. That, you know, if we tell these people that if they put X amount of this product in their ash tree, that it can help. But then we find out later, um, this was, you know, early on in our Hort career, that after a certain diameter that that tree is, which is probably what most people have uh, is beyond this 10 to 12 inch diameter that 10 to 12. I feel like I've heard up to 14. Maybe that's what it is. Is that either way when you're about 10 to 12, once it goes, you're past past a foot doing the root absorption of it, of imidacloprid is just not going to happen. You know, you'd have, you have to do injections, which are usually, applied by a certified arborist especially since the homeowner versions they say to pour at the base of the tree and none of your fine feeder roots right are at the base of the tree yeah you would you would be dumping gallons and gallons and gallons and gallons and gallons of this to do something for the tree all the while also killing any other beneficial insects that are in the ground underneath this massive tree because that chemical then will also translocate to all parts of that plant Mm -hmm. so if you be absorbed by the grass underneath the tree or any plant underneath that tree yeah and if that tree that you're applying it on is a flowering tree which most trees even if it's a very small subtle insignificant flower oak trees flower maple trees flower they they are flowering to then be pollinated to produce a seed to reproduce that chemical will translocate to the flowers the pollen the petals everything uh leaves stems shoots all parts of that plant and then is acutely toxic to um, generally just about every insect for for practical purposes Mm -hmm. so even your beneficials your bees butterflies all your beneficial pollinators that can impact negatively and acutely so be single exposure conscientious of when i'm not saying that there isn't a scenario where a systemic is, you know, maybe your best mode of action for saving a plant. Mm -hmm. You just have to know what you're doing and be conscientious of the fact that you may harm some insects in, in your attempt to save a plant, you are likely harming beneficial insects. And, you know, sometimes that's just the world we live in. You sometimes have to weigh, pick the lesser of two evils that better works for you. And, as long as you know what you're doing, you know, that's that's all you can do. If you find it to be the best decision for you to use that, no judgment. Generally, if somebody, if I'm recommending a, a neonic or a systemic insecticide to someone, it's usually for an interior, yes. uh, non-flowering You'll find imidacloprid as house a houseplant dust, yes. Yep. Yep. Uh, and then also with the 
with the qualifier of it being something they're not going to eat. Very rarely. Uh, actually, I should say I, I never. Yeah, I shouldn't even say very rarely. Yeah, I never recommend imidacloprid for anything that for sure is a well-known flowering shrub or tree. Mm -hmm. Sometimes, you know, if with like an evergreen that you're shearing regularly, like a boxwood, sure. You know, if you shear your boxwoods regularly, they're not flowering or they're flowering to such a reduced sense. It's not really drawing pollinators in, in that sense. I think using something like imidacloprid is okay for controlling leaf miner in that sense, which is hard to spray for. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I have, I morally, I find it uh, too difficult to say like, Oh, you have Japanese beetles chewing your crab apple tree. Here's some imidacloprid to use on it. You're going to kill the Japanese beetles. But I know that with crab apples, they're a huge nectar source for mm -hmm. so many insects I and just, that chemical and chemicals in that neonic or neonicotinoid category are are pretty much one of the biggest ones responsible for uh, colony die offs of, yeah, of honeybees mm -hmm. and yeah a bee will take that to the hive which we you know we discussed this one a little bit in our our misconceptions about bees and, and pollinator episode but this is a little more in depth for you guys so then you have carbaryl carbaryl is an mm -hmm. active ingredient in seven whether you use it as a spray or a dust, that is a contact kill only as well. It's The dust is, is a preventative only because it's in a granular form. But you just have to be very, you can over dust your plant and kill the plant that way by essentially over intoxication of this substance. So a light dust is what, if you choose to go that route, you definitely want to do a light dusting on your plant or the spray but it is non-selective. It will kill any, if not most, insects that fleas it... Fleas and ticks and, mm -hmm. and Japanese beetles and you name it. Yep. So it'll kill most things. I generally, and this is, this is my take, I know that they state on that label that you can use that up to a certain number of days of harvest on edible plants. But I would not particularly recommend carborol or seven or or some of these others the the neonics yeah imidacloprid is plant. going to be in the fruit that you eat right i as far as these synthetics or these conventionals typically i do not recommend them on something that is going to be consumed and again that's just my take mm -hmm. take Amid it or leave it imidacloprid is something that they will use for things that we humans will use for ourselves as also for our... It's used um, in flea and tick medications for, for pets. It yep. use, it's used in lice for treatments. Us too, exactly. So it, it is uh, it is commonly used. Is pyrethrins that, are used in, in some exactly. of those as well. So you can also get the same effect yeah. from pyrethrin. So while it is a synthetic and can be harmful, it is something that they've also seems to hopefully found a way to incorporate in our lives that aren't hugely detrimental to us, but we'll see. I'll, Sometimes I'll I feel put like a we're big guinea pigs. Yeah. I'll put a big asterisk by that because as with a lot of these chemicals back when I had to know this information in school, I think it was something like 800,000 new chemicals were introduced in the U.S. every year in the kind of pool of things introduced that the FDA had to test to or or was available to be tested by the FDA to, dis to determine its safety. And I think they only were testing 80,000 per year. Yeah, yeah. And so 10 percent. And I imagine that sometimes money factors into no okay, right that gets no. you past the here? five to ten year field study here where we say to. it's safe until you prove it's not right yeah mm -hmm. yeah mm. so on that note if you're gonna eat it maybe go omri listed yeah yep malathion Malathion is one of those things that I can honestly I'm not as familiar with that because since I have entered the world of horticulture, it has slowly left the world mm -hmm. of horticulture as far as what you can find over the counter. Uh, what I remember it being listed as was sort of a livestock spray, something that was <laughs> safe to spray your livestock with. 
to to shield them or to help kill any chewing or biting um, flies and mosquitoes, like gnats or whatever. You could just spray your livestock with them or spray the the ground around them. I'm assuming since it has found its way more so off the shelf outside of probably in large stores where you will find farm material Mm -hmm. uh, like a tractor supply or a farm and fleet, something like that. I'm assuming it's not as good as it was originally intended to be for the health of your animals and or yourself, or it would likely be more prevalent (laughs) on the shelves wherever you might be buying it at a garden center. But that is one of the things where I... I don't really see it anywhere, especially since I've come down to St. Louis, but this St. Louis and the more metropolitan area, you know, it's not like where we lived in an Illinois where there's just so many crop fields where you just, it's just empty flat land of cows and down there. It it seems like they're uh, particularly where you're working. They're definitely more focused on the natural and organic route. There is a very large and growing and established pro natural um, down here as far as just all the way encompassing to like planting more native species. Sure. Uh, which was not what I went to school learning, you know, pretty much my mentality out of Hort school was don't plant a native in someone's yard. It's a weed. It's not something that's easily maintained or, you know, your the average homeowner is not going to be able to control it or care for it appropriately to keep it. Or it might not have as nice of a, you know, nice little round short or or shorter bloom time or whatever. Whereas down here, the natives are very well embraced, have Mm -hmm. a huge following and natural controls for insecticides and fungicides uh, is much more adopted down here, which is something was a little more new to me coming from central Illinois, where it's still very, you know, there is a growing movement towards natural and organics, but still very pro-synthetic. Yeah, for sure. So we are going to, uh, because this particular topic covers such a range, I think we're going to split this out into a couple episodes. So we are going to cover one more category here, and that is the biological category or the um, biocontrol category for pest management. And we'll have to leave fungal control, bacterial control. And molds or water molds. That'll That'll have to be another episode. Part two. We can even talk about viruses as well. Not that there's much control you can do for that. True. But still, we can kind of touch on all of those in another episode. I think maybe at the beginning of this episode, we said we were going to touch on this, but we got really into it on insects and arachnids. Yeah. We haven't even talked about arachnids. We haven't (laughs) even talked about arachnids yet. So we will cover arachnids, fungal, bacterial, and molds or water molds in part two. Isn't it really just spider mites? That's going to be the main one. Yeah. Should we just throw spider mites into this? We could. All right. Well, let's, let's before we, okay. Spider mites. (laughs) Spider mites. Spider mites. Okay. Spider mites like tent caterpillars. Will also are the create same. a <laughs> the exact same, just like dipel dots the exact and same plants. Earth. Yeah. <laughs> um, no, the uh, spider mites will produce a webbing, and they are technically an arachnid. Yes, so they that, are a mite. On that note, it does make them more tricky to treat because you can't necessarily always treat arachnids with a chemical that is meant for insects. we were talking about this what was it maybe a day or two ago we had kind of brought this up and what what did we say we said um most most controls for arachnids will also kill a broad spectrum of insects mm-hmm. whereas a lot of things for insects don't necessarily kill arachnids correct yeah but one of the things that can is neem and I believe pyrethrin is as an organic will also kill arachnids. Possibly. I, I think it somewhat depends on um, brand by brand, whether it's the pyrethrins or the permethrins. I know for sure that a lot of the insecticidal, insecticidal soaps, soap for sure. Yep. A brand of that. I, I don't think we mentioned a brand earlier. A brand of that I use quite a bit as far as... Pyrethrins is also listed as it is. being able to kill. It does say, this is from Safer Brand. This is from their website, mm-hmm. which Safer Brand is 
a company that sells a lot of naturals yep. for controls. They sell insecticidal soap. They sell pyrethrins. They sell neem. And on their site, they say a combination of insecticidal soap and pyrethrins will kill mm-hmm. spider mites on contact. Sure. And neem oil helps prevent reinfestation by killing the egg and larval stages of the insect. Sure. So a combination. So right there, you have insecticidal soap, pyrethrins, and neem recommended right. to kill in all of them in conjuncture right. to kill spider mites. So they really are. A and you're covering to get rid of. multiple modes of action. Right. And yeah. And spider mites, again... If you have a dwarf Alberta spruce, (laughs) you've likely encountered spider mites. And you'll likely soon not have a nice-looking dwarf Alberta spruce. If you've ever had an elephant ear or a... Any plant of any kind. (laughs) If you have gardened. (laughs) Right. Yeah. Uh, But yeah, spider mites will usually have that webbing. That's usually something that shows... Sometimes it starts off very subtle in a small Leave population a web from one yeah. leaf to the other. And you're like, oh, it was just a little spider. Or if you have a distorted leaf and you flip that over and there's kind of some webbing under there, that's yep. another sign. But they, you know, sometimes you can and you can tell if you have them, if you're unsure, get a blank white piece of paper, hold that under what you believe is infested, knock it around. And if you get some things that fall off and start moving around. Yep. And white or or black paper, something with high contrast, that's a good test. Sure, you sure. can use that for thrips, aphids, uh, a lot of different things there is to kind of, because sometimes you might end up with, uh, it's not uncommon for me to see aphids and thrips on the same plant. Or, Gross. Yeah, yeah. You can often have more than one At spider that point, mites and you thrips. just throw the damn yeah. plant away. Yeah, really. Ugh. If you have thrips and spider mites or spider mites and aphids at the same time really i feel like the best treatment is like what um gas and a match yep yeah Mm -hmm. um if you have both of those you should also have a flamethrower right (laughs) so in addition to those oh and jumping back briefly copa is another brand of insecticidal soap that I've used quite a bit. Usually oh, okay. available more in a commercial volume, like two I'm and a half gallon or something like that. But if you if you have a big space and you're going to keep that year to year and you have proper storage, you know you can buy quite a bit of it at a time and just keep it on hand. Horticultural oil is another one, mm-hmm. which was is a petroleum derivative, right? A clear liquid usually in like suffocates mm-hmm. the it coats them right and they can't breathe yep. and so it's effective on all stages yep. whether from from egg to adult horticultural oil can be pretty effective but be, i do usually recommend caution as far as some plants also can be bothered by that as well and you definitely don't want to spray that on a sunny day correct because spraying your plant with oil and then hitting it with sunlight right. is a recipe for a cooked plant. Right. And whereas the horticultural oil is completely encompassing and preventing a pest from breathing in high quantities, it can also sometimes inhibit the leaf from breathing as well. Yeah. So it's just something to be somewhat conscientious of. I'm not saying that's going to always happen, but it is something to be conscientious of, especially when you're spraying it on smaller plants like house plants or whatever right. uh, that have a smaller leaf or just like a smaller area. Right. And speaking of horticultural oil, that can also be great to treat other tricky things like scale and mealybug because of that nice coating. Especially for scale. Yep. Absolutely for scale. Yep. Because that armor really shields them. Right. So sometimes the horticultural oil will lower the guard of the scale where it gets encapsulated and it can't breathe. So it starts to move Mm -hmm. and it exposes portions of its underside as it's trying to relocate itself and then then become more coated. Right. And or to then be able to be hit with another insecticide. Sure. And if we didn't say the spider mites also very, 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 very tiny the size of you know pin pencil, po- a yeah. pinpoint of pencil. a of a yeah of a mechanical pencil or something like that if you and can they colonize they're not yeah. like individually they're in colonies and if you can get in close enough to see them usually their main body is kind of like a reddish brown yes but not necessarily to be confused with red mites that you might see right. on like a picnic table they or usually have like what a kind of a yellowish legs yeah yeah 
So then just to wrap up, we'll briefly cover biological controls, which can be great for these guys, mm-hmm. a lot of these insect pests that we've covered, and biological controls or... Which or you've already touched on with the... Biomanagement, uh, lots of different names for that. That'd be your ladybugs. Yep. Ladybugs, praying mantis, uh, lace wings. Again, the ladybug larva are usually the ones that they eat more. That eat They're more. Really they growing. can eat what a hundred plus a day. And lace wing larva. I think lace wing larva eats which even more. It's like four hundred a day per larva. Yeah. So you can usually buy the ladybugs in more adult form. Lace wings you can get as adults, or you can get the eggs. Obviously, you want the eggs that are going to turn into larva because the larva are the most aggressive towards aphid control. Praying mantis, usually you get as a dormant egg sac as well. Mm-hmm. And the egg sac super cool. And the, I love the little praying mantids that come out of that. Mm-hmm. They look like little weedy little, baby miniature. Little tiny. Oh, I remember I had saved two egg sacs from a previous fall. Mm-hmm. They were on my burning bush. Uh, um, and uh, I, I cut them off and I kept them. And then I put them back out in spring in my two flower arrangement porch pots. Mm-hmm. And they hatched. Unfortunately, they hatched when it was a torrential downpour. Mm-hmm. So I'm leaving out the front door to go to work. And also I'm like, why is the ground moving? It's because I had two Um, egg sacs both hatch at the same time. And all these little baby praying mantids were all over the deck, just like getting pummeled by rain droplets. And and I'm stepping on them. I'm like, (laughs) no. So then I'm like, I'm getting like this little dust pan and a little broom. And I'm trying to like scoop them into this pan and kind of like put them in my plants that were all out on my deck to kind of like, Give them some sort of shelter. Something, you know, Lindsay, my wife, comes out and she's like, what are you doing? I was like, stop. (laughs) Don't move. The the babies. (laughs) The the babies. But yeah, I love my little praying mantids and they're very effective. They'll eat Japanese beetles, too. I have a great picture of uh, one Mm -hmm. that has three Japanese beetles, two in one arm and one in the other. So Mm -hmm. they're bosses. But they'll also kill bees and butterflies, too. They yeah, they pray mantid eat don't, anything that buzzes by. Pray mantid don't give a crap. <laughs> right. And a couple others are predatory mites and predatory or parasitoid wasps. The predatory mites can be used for a variety of insects as well. Again, that's a very tiny, tiny mite. You're not really going to see them around necessarily unless you're really looking for it. But a lot of these, and and we'll list a couple sources where you can track these down if you want to try a biological control instead of spraying a chemical. There are different types of predatory mites for different types of insects. Right. Um, So you can get mites to control thrips. You can get mites to control aphids. I think there's mites you can get to control other mites. I believe so. Yeah. Yeah. And then the parasitoid wasps are one of my favorites. Mm -hmm. Especially if you have those stupid tomato hornworms. Oh, is there a parasitoid wasp for those? Oh, Have you ever seen the tomato hornworms that have like those little white looks like rice sticking out of their backs? That's the wasp egg. Oh, yes. Yep, 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 yep. And it's I, too bad because the hummingbird moth that comes out of the mm-hmm. tomato hornworm is such or, or a the, cool the sphinx moth. Yeah, it looks like a hummingbird, a lobster, and a moth had a baby. There's <laughs> such <laughs> yeah, that's pretty accurate actually. <laughs> <laughs> They're so cool, but the worm is so destructive. S- such a begonia. Right. You know? <laughs> I remember my mom had them on her tomato plants when she could not figure out what the hell was decimating her tomato plants and she yeah. could not see them. It's amazing. This fat worm, the size of your middle finger can camouflage itself on a yeah. tomato plant. And I said to her, I was like, and look underneath eat, leaves. Eat, 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 eat. I said, you need to look under the leaves, look really close to the stem. And sure enough, I think it was like the next day she took a picture of this big fat son of a worm. Mm-hmm. And uh, it's like, yep, there it was. There I was like, is. they can just, mow down your tomato plants yep. but yeah so the parasitic wasps will lay their eggs on that and then they get eaten alive from the inside yeah i most often when i think of parasitoid wasps think of the ones that go after aphids sure and what they'll do i'll try to find a link and post a video of this same with the ants farming the aphids because those can kind of go go along with each other but what they do it's a tiny what not even not even a half an inch long 
little tiny wasp, Mm -hmm. maybe like three eighths of an inch long. You might think from, uh, you know, you might think it's like a flying ant or something. Yeah. Pretty not going to cause any harm to us at all. But what they'll do is they'll find these aphids and they kind of dance around with the aphid until they get behind them. And then they just kind of poke them with a, a little stinger on their butt. And what that does is it injects a single egg into the aphid. And once that egg hatches, the larva of the wasp will start to feed on the aphid from the inside. It's very mummy uh, or uh, it's very Mm alien-esque. And so as that happens, the aphid is still alive, but it essentially becomes a mummy just kind of aimlessly wandering around on the plant. They start to enlarge in size and get larger than the other aphids around them. Yep. And at some point they stop moving. The fully grown wasp cuts a tiny, perfectly circular little hole in the abdomen of the aphid. The aphid's dead at this point. And then they emerge as an adult from the shell of this aphid. It's, it is terrifying. I don't want a human version of this. So many times, but it is very cool. We're just, we as humans, I think don't really, I don't think we're grateful enough that insects are not our size <laughs> right <laughs> but yeah oh do you wonder if the i wonder if the aphid because those parasitic wasps that go after them kind of look like they could be a flying ant and ants to aphids are like oh it's an ant it's okay i don't have to worry about <laughs> my guard is dropped they just want to eat my honeydew booty brew and then the aphids like nah i'm gonna stab you and then when that- you see the video of the videos of these wasps trying to inject the aphids with the egg, the aphids know what's up. Okay. They are like not having it. (laughs) (laughs) So I will, I will post a video of that. Okay, cool. And so if you're interested in looking into these biocontrols more, two companies that we have both worked with are BioBest and also Tip Top Bio. I used to order ladybugs and nematodes, uh, which nematodes can be used to control fungus gnats and other soil born uh, yeah, nematodes you put larva. in your soil. Yeah, you um, water them in. They'll eat grub larva. They'll eat flea larva. They'll eat mosquito larva, tick larva. And sometimes different varieties for different target pests again. Right. And nematodes, not to be confused, there are bad nematodes in your garden. Anyone who is an avid gardener might be familiar with nematodes that can affect the root system of their tomato plants or potato plants. So this particular nematode is a beneficial one, but you can find this on Tip Top Bio. I've purchased those for sale. I've purchased uh, ladybugs from Tip Top Bio. Um, We used to get ladybugs for the greenhouse. We would order... I don't know, 15, 20,000 of them and re- release, you know, a handful yep. of thousand in each greenhouse to, to just as a preventative for aphid populations. But either one of those websites, I believe you can order directly from them as retail. And of course, if you're a bigger operation, you can set up a wholesale account and, you know, they're not sponsoring us or anything, but. And it's um, one thing to keep in control. Like if you're going to go the biological control, mm-hmm. you can't use insecticides too, even if they're organic. Unless you're planning to spray use, and use then both use. on a on a regular cycle, I was talking to Michael Dyer, who manages the biology research greenhouses at Washington University in St. Louis, and he was telling me how they, if they need to spray, they will, but they will often, on roughly a two week cycle, they will introduce biological controls, beneficial predatory insects to keep pest insect populations under control in their research greenhouses. Okay, cool. Yeah. So, which not everybody has the budget to, <laughs> to be buying their beneficials every two weeks, but Hey, if you can do it and, and you want to go that route and not have to spray, you certainly can. Sure. So I think with that, we will go ahead and that's a long episode. Yeah, we hit hit you guys with a lot of information, but hopefully uh, you found a lot of that to be useful. I know we covered quite a bit, but uh, this time of year, especially as we head into summer, a lot of these insect pests are going to be popping up and, and becoming a problem for a lot of people. It's something we would run into very often in both garden centers and with our, our clients for our own businesses. So Hopefully this helped a few of you have a little more information on how to tackle these problems and not be... To feel uh, more comfortable with yeah, it. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And so in our next episode, 
part two of this for pest management. We will then get into more specifics on fungal diseases, bacterial diseases, as well as molds or water molds that can affect your plants. But for now, this has wrapped up the insect and arachnid portion. Yeah. And with that, this has been the Take It or Leave It podcast. I'm Nick Farrington. I'm Ethan Wise. And we'll see you guys next time. Yep. Yeah.